Hello, everyone. Welcome to our GEMA Talks vidcast series. I'm Rich Batista. Today, we have a terrific Hoya with us in the film industry, and that is John Hodges. He's a College 2000 graduate. John is the head of film at Jax Media, which is a, uh, a company that creates content in television and, and, and more recently movies, which we'll talk a bit about. Uh, John's had a long career in the film industry. You know, one of his um, most distinguished accomplishments is being a co-founder of A24, which has um, become probably the premier independent film production company and distribution company in the market. Um, so we have lots to talk about today, and I want to introduce John Hodges. Hey, John. Hey, Rich. How are you? How are you? How are you doing uh, during these uh, insane times, and, and where are you physically? Um, we're well. So my wife um, and two children, I have a, a fifth and a first grader and two uh, dogs we are quarantined in, in South Jersey okay. you know I'm trying to make the the best of a, of a tough situation we all are fortunately healthy as is sort of our extended family so no no large complaints that's good to hear um, yeah. before we get into um, the questioning why, why don't you for our audience why don't you give them a, a, a brief overview of, of Jack's media Jax is doing some unbelievably exciting content in the, in the market. Why don't you tell them a little bit about Jax Media sure. and what your role specifically entails? Sure. So Jax has been around for about 10 years and was launched um, as what's called a production services company um, in television primarily. And so a lot of the, the larger studios will um, contract out to companies like Jax for some of their lower budget shows. You know, at the time, those things around a million, million and a half uh, per episode. Um, and it's just because it's easier for them, they can get better deals with the unions and things like that. And so Jack's built up a reputation first off of uh, Louis C.K. show um, for, for FX and then things like Broad City and Lady uh -huh. Schumer and just really got a, a really great reputation as, as delivering high quality um, for a very competitive price. And out of that um, grew into developing their own shows those shows kind of came to them from, from the studio or from the network um, and then started developing their own projects in-house um, in addition to still doing that production services business and then ultimately expanding even further into, um, into film uh, and unscripted, which is kind of where we are now. Uh, the company, you know, prior to this work stoppage had 17 shows across their portfolio um, and we had two movies um, in, in production. So just a lot of content. So you were brought on to really kickstart, jumpstart the, the film, film part of the company. Exactly. I think, you know, like everybody, you know, the, the business as a whole, all the content creators are working in both medium in a way uh, like they never have before, um, both film and television. And so as people were looking to do film projects in between their television shows, it just kind of made sense to hopefully be a home you know, for those creators to help them realize the totality of their vision in whichever medium makes the most sense. Uh, so it was brought on to do that. And so we develop um, projects in-house. We'll help, you know, people if they have something set up and we'll help them make it elsewhere. Um, but looking to develop a slate that feels very Jaxist, which is, you know, content that is sort of edgy into the left or right of center, whichever way that kind of goes, but feels very distinct and authorial in its intention. And, um, and obviously the film industry has, has been you know, impacted in some ways like no other industry the coronavirus yeah. situation um how has it impacted you know your company and, and and we can talk about the industry at large once you yeah i mean you see the industries these industries that were on the precipice of large change or kind of resisting change and then this is just you know being uh is speeding that through um obviously Anytime you have to get together a group of 50 to 150 people to make something, you know, it's going to be really hard right now, let alone people getting together to consume the media in, in the theatrical setting. Um, obviously, it's a great time for the streamers. So for us, you know, we're able to build a, our, our slate right now and really work on development and put writers to work. But in terms of production, you know, everything is completely shut down. You know, I think what's different now as opposed to some of the other work stoppages, like when there's a union or a contract dispute between the guilds, um, is that everybody is very committed to figuring out how to get people back to work once it's safe. And so, you know, as we look at our movies and our shows, it's 
figuring out how the insurance companies are going to work with, you know, if you have a bank involved or with the studio and just really who's liable for, you know, for delivering this content, um, you know, in a timely manner, if there's another work stop, if there's somebody gets sick. And those are all the very practical things we're just trying to work through right now to, to get people back to work when it's, when it's ready. Some people may not realize that even though production is halted in the movie, business in the movie production business and the content business, you're obviously constantly developing projects. So I assume that part of the business is is still moving quite quickly. And because of the Zoom ecosystem we live in today, it can actually run quite well. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, you, you'll see it. I mean, we have two shows that are actually shooting in this um, environment. Um, we do a show on Showtime called Beezus and Marrow, which is more of a talk format. And then obviously Sam B's show on, on TBS. And and we're able to keep those shows up, keep everybody employed. You know, the shows don't look exactly like they did before. They're shot on iPhones, but we're able to kind of keep them going. And 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 people come to those shows for a variety of reasons. So um, it's it's really important to keep them uh, up and active as much as we can. But yes, you know, in terms of the scripted stuff, um, we're able to do virtual writers' rooms in some of our shows, so that the scripts will be ready when the time comes. Um, people are actively sort of altering what some of the content will be, things that we see it as probably being a staged rollout when production comes back, smaller things or shows that, or films that have a smaller footprint in terms of the crew size for it, um, will probably get going first as opposed to, you know, huge Marvel movies, um, you know, where there's just a lot of different touch points. So, um, you know, we're prioritizing certain types of development um, as, we, as we go forward, but there's gonna be a lot of scripts coming out of this. A lot of people are writing and developing and creating content, which is great. Are there certain formats that you think may accelerate because of this or new formats that may arise from this? Um, you know, it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously the last, you know, work stoppage really, you know, brought in reality television in a, in a, in a big way. And so, yes, I, I don't know exactly what that will be, um, but I think, you know, sort of like going back and looking at shows that, you know, again, feel very specific, but aren't, you know, um, the scope might not be as big, you know, there'll be a lot of that content, you know, some of our unscripted shows are, are you know, going to be greenlit first, especially if they're on a stage, which is very controlled, um, and you can really um, keep a, a close contact on, on who is interacting, um, so you'll see a lot of things like that, where it's back on the studio. Are you working on any animation projects, because I know that's an area that obviously is um, yeah, more more uh, facile in a world where there's uh, not stages and actors and such. Exactly. Um, we have one animated show. It's not mine, so I can't really speak to it. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, that is one area because some of the animators can work from home. Um, you know, they they are able to kind of push that forward. You know, the timing of those shows is just really long between getting the scripts ready and then animating them and then voicing them. It just, the lead time is, is can be a little bit, you know, um, lengthy, but other than that, it's, uh, that's one where it can, can certainly go forward in this environment. Are there, are there any, um, you know, as you look forward, first off, is there any predictions on when you think production will start up again? Um, I don't, I wouldn't make a prediction. I'll, I'll make a hope, right? I, I would hope that, that, you know, if we see whatever the flattening of the curve or the easing of the, you know, the, con the contagion, um, that we could be shooting something by early, early fall. You know, everybody's kind of taking a wait and see approach and they keep kind of pushing it out almost in, you know, 15 and 30 day increments. And right now everybody's like kind of hovering around the August timeline. Um, and, you know, that could, could keep keep pushing out. We'll see, but I'm I'm hoping we can get some people back working by by the late summer. Yeah, and will there be? Do you think there'll be a, a new normal, so to speak? Will there be some real changes that will have a lasting impact in, in the business in terms of how they produce film or distribute? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you know. <laughs> Obviously, you know, I was talking about insurance. There's just like fundamental things of, of you know, that is a, a not a sexy thing to talk about, but it's, you know, it's like, oh, if your actor gets, you know, COVID and is out and you have to shut down, who's liable for that? And 
you know, who has to eat that cost. And I think that's a big thing that we just really have to figure out right now. You know, we saw this after after 9-11, there was a certain type of, that insurance package changed, you know, mm -hmm. for catastrophic events and those types of work stoppage. And, you know, it's another thing that we just have to kind of work through. Mm -hmm. Outside of that, obviously, you know, testing people, um, you know, making sure that, you know, that the medic that's already on set is really checking people's temperatures. And if they are sick, don't come to work, you know, stay away and, and things like that, that, that we'll just kind of see. There's a lot of lists that are kind of coming together of all of the sort of safety regulations that we will see. Um, and I think you will see a little bit of a contraction in some of the crew size for a while to try to you know, mitigate some of those um, various touch points. Um, but yeah, I think there will be lasting impact from this. And then, you know, that's just on a physical production standpoint. And then there's obviously the changes to the actual windowing and, you know, consumption of media. Obviously, it's a great time to be a streamer um, and, and probably, you know, obviously a much more difficult time, you know, to be in the theatrical business. Yeah. I believe in the theatrical business. I think, you know, the communal experience of film is, is something that can be really powerful. Um, but I think you'll see certain types of movies will it will probably migrate out of theatrical and into a streaming environment almost more exclusively, and certain things will will kind of stay in in, in that theatrical world. You think you think the sort of the the, the big tentpole superhero type movies spectacles those are the ones that'll probably stay in theaters yeah. more than that. I, I think so. I also, I, you know, I, I do believe in the theatrical for some of the independent films, some of those prestige movies, you know, those, you know, platform release types of films. You know, I think that there's something very potent about that and allows audiences to engage in it. You know, the problem with just going full into, you know, a streaming environment is something like Parasite. You know, would that just get dropped on a site and be right. lost within a, a little bit of time? But that campaign allowed people to really start to yeah. snowball into something. Um, and it's a fantastic film and people found it and it was rewarded for it, both in terms of the box office and, and in terms of the hardware that they want. You know, the other thing I know I think about, and I've also read others think about, is as much as people say, well, boy, if you stay, you know, if you put a movie in a movie theater, there's in some cases, hundreds of millions of marketing costs that go mm -hmm. against it. And boy, if you go on a streamer, you, you basically save all those costs. But I do think, and I don't know, it's hard, it's going to take years to actually analyze this, but I do think there's downstream value halo effect to having that unbelievable marketing spend early on. It's almost like an initial investment on a piece of IP that's going to last for 100 years, right? So I agree. kind of like the parasite I example, I guess, right? But when you start saying, yeah. okay, you know, when a, when a movie's on, again, when a movie's on Netflix, it goes on Netflix, it's popular for a while, and then it's buried on Netflix somewhere for the next 50 years. And, you know, there's no reason to ever see it again. It doesn't show up on television. It doesn't show up in the home video. It doesn't show up in an airplane, you know. So I, I do yeah. worry about that. I, I Listen, I, I think you're right. It, it all depends on what we're talking about. You know, if we're launching, you know, a, a Marvel film, Right. You know, it's like you're as much marketing toys as you are, you know, the actual sure. film itself and, sure. and sort of everything that kind of goes with it. You know, it's sort of those like two quadrant movies, you know, it's kind of an action movie or romantic comedy. And yeah, you know, it's really hard for those. So what's going to catch fire, you know, on Netflix or Quibi or you know, HBO Max or the Peacock or whatever platform Amazon, you know, we're talking about. And, and you know, it is sort of hard to predict which ones will, will ultimately kind of resonate or kind of be lost in dust. Yeah. Give, give our audience a little bit of a behind the curtain on how you think about developing films or, you know, you personally, like what's your process? Are you somebody who reads a script and, 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 and then that's your first piece or do you have a concept in mind or do you get a pitch from someone and then you ask them to go write it? Is it all the above? Just give, give an idea, especially folks who you know, aren't in the industry who are interested in it would like to understand that more. Yeah, I think a lot of the things that, that I personally have, have had success with or places I've gone and then also Jax as a company there's a lot of like creator driven content. You know, if you look at, you know, sort of like inside Amy Schumer, it's so much of like who she is. Same thing with Broad City. Who's, right. you know, those, those Louis, Louis, oh. Louis and, it, and it's very authorial and that distinction leads to 
something that feels very unique and then you know speaks to a defined audience and i think that really kind of resonates out from there i think a24 had a very similar approach um in in looking at you know how many spring break movies were made but only harmony corinne makes spring breakers and how many sort of like man-eating alien movies were there but only jonathan glazer makes under the skin and barry jenkins makes moonlight and what have you and i think that sort of authorial kind of approach is what gets me excited and then working with those people mm -hmm. that being said sometimes we'll read an article and we're like this is just this is fascinating you know like oh well, let's marry this article with this voice and, and try to put that together right. um but a lot of it is you know you know sort of like writer directors or writers having those ideas or performer writers what have you kind of coming in and saying oh i've always wanted to do something in this space and then sort of you know, developing and refining it with them, um, you know, over the process. Yeah. Um, I'd love to ask you about your, uh, the genesis of your career, because, um, uh, yeah. you know, I know we talked a little bit about this before, but at, at Georgetown, you weren't someone who was at Georgetown immediately saying, I'm, I want to be in the film industry, right? Tell, tell, the, no. tell the folks a little bit about what you were thinking about career-wise at Georgetown, what yeah. your first few steps were at, at, when you left Georgetown. Yeah, I, I'm the product of liberal arts education. I was able to find my way eventually. So I came into Georgetown thinking I wanted to be a doctor and had a heavy focus in, in science. Um, after my first year, realized that wasn't my path. Didn't know what was ahead of me. And then uh, started taking a lot of government courses, obviously the ones that you know, you're sort of like um, mandated, but then taking a bunch more and really enjoyed that. Um, and and thought coming out of that that maybe law school would be sort of where where i wanted to go um but really didn't know i had always had a passion for film and consumed a ton of film and television yeah. um, like a lot of people and and really but even more than that I, I thought about it as a career option and i ended up taking a job coming out of georgetown working for booz allen and hamilton which is a consulting company and I'd specifically chosen Booz because they had recently um, been part of the restructure of Viacom and MTV in particular, which at that time was still relevant. And um, and and so I I felt like oh I can kind of do this business thing or work within a in a kind of a, a structure that I know but have a, a touch point, um, you know, to the entertainment business. Right. And then quickly realized once you're in the inside that it's so far apart from one another. Right. And and really took that first year out of school where I was making good money and and you know being challenged but just wasn't feeling fully rewarded and and decided you were that, you were living in Washington D.C. I was yeah working at the McLean campus okay. um, for booth okay and um and then ultimately you know kind of quit and moved to New York because I wasn't brave enough to move to California yet as an East Coast boy. And, um, and and was fortunate enough to get a job kind of leveraging the Loyal Nine Network and a few other people that had taken jobs in the business and were like, this is how you get into it. Because, you know, on the creative side of entertainment, it's very apprentice-like. There aren't, you know, as you're coming out of school, like, oh, there's this many jobs that you can apply for. You drop a bunch of resumes and you get hired. It's on a first-come, first-served basis. And, it, and it's very much like somebody got fired, they need to get hired that day. And and that kind of is the way it happens, especially at the entry level, because yeah. uh, everybody pretty much starts as an assistant. And so, what was your first job in the biz? I, in the biz, I uh, I got hired as the second assistant to a man named Scott Greenstein, who was then the chairman of USA Films, which was part of Barry Diller's Entertainment um, Properties, right. uh, sort of around 2000, and he had sort of the USA Network, um, Sci-Fi, and Bravo, and, and had started an independent film company that was just a domestic distribution company. And then what happened is about a year and a half later, uh, he sold those businesses back to uh, Universal, and they rolled up what was uh, USA Films with a small independent label they had, and then had acquired this company called Good Machine International, which was an international distribution production company. And they merged them all together to create focus features. And I stayed on through that as an assistant for about another six months and then got hired into the acquisitions department there. And that was really the beginning of sort of like my film career, sort of like traveling that festival circuit, which is very regimented, you know, starting in the fall in Toronto and then Sundance in January in Berlin. And just, and just to explain, explain to the audience, the acquisition side, you know, you're looking for already made films, right? That, yeah. That already yeah. Made, like you said, at the festivals, et cetera. Okay. 
exactly or or you know co-productions there's a script and piece of talent we'll buy for these territories and you know you realize you know most people think just warner brothers makes a movie or you know paramount or what have you and you realize that there's this vibrant you know international marketplace that kind of cobbles together how a lot of these movies get yeah. made especially at that time i would imagine one of the uh, valuable pieces of that type of role is is um that you do learn the financial side of the business yeah. well. you understand where the money comes from and how how money is cobbled together to, to, to generate you know the revenues and, and, and generate the production budgets and, it, it was a crash course in the, in film you know i knew what i liked but you know what sells and and how do these movies come together and what works and what doesn't work and and it was it was a you know sometimes uncomfortable and sometimes really rewarding experience um, yeah. but, but, but ultimately really good so how did A24 come about after that? So I had a couple couple jobs from there, but actually one of you know my partners that the founded the company with um, Daniel Katz was another acquisitions executive, and we kind of came up together. We were roughly the same age, and you know as you're kind of going about, you kind of figure out who has sort of either shared values or similar taste or what have you, and. And and we really did, and and you know became came close and became friends outside of work. And then uh, a guy that he was working with at the time, uh, David Finkel, also became one of the founding partners of the company. And you know we just stayed in touch, and we all went on to different things. I went to a very you know producerial path and was producing movies. Daniel actually left film and went to work at a hedge fund, ultimately to come back, but really wanted to understand you know. Uh, capital markets to be able to do something entrepreneurial in the space. And David went on and, and founded a company um, called Oscilloscope Laboratories with um, the right. Adam Yauk, which right. is a very boutique distribution company uh, out of New York. And so I guess it was launched in 2012, so about three years before that. You know, we just were getting together a lot and talking because it felt like the market was ready for something new in this space. Um, and that a new distributor could kind of come in and, and create some disruption and create some noise and kind of bring a new model to it. And so we slowly workshop that over a period of three years and we're on the one yard line for a, what felt like a year or so. Um, and then finally we capitalized and launched uh, in the spring of 2012, I think April. Right, and, and what were some of the films that put you guys on the map? We had an interesting run and, and so there was, <laughs> You know, it's all timing, you know, because all these movies were acquisitions for us in the beginning because we, we knew we would be defined by what we put out. So we didn't, you know, focus um, in the beginning on making our own movies, but, you know, sort of sourcing from, from that market that we just talked about. And so um, we had a couple of small films that came out of the gate, um, a Charlie Sheen movie, Inside the Mind of Char uh, Charles Swan III, and a movie, a small movie called Ginger and Rosa were the two first movies out of the gate. And then it was Spring Breakers, The Bling Ring, and Spectacular Now. And those three kind of in short succession in the marketplace created a little bit of a ripple and were buzzy and were of a similar audience segment. They were a little bit younger skewing, a little bit, you know, edgy. And, and it just sort of like codified what became, you know, the A24 approach and sort of style. Yeah, and it's, um, you know, uh, again, I, I'm not sure the audience knows that there aren't that many independents that have stayed successful over the last, you know, five to seven years. And, you know, A24 really would prove, prove to be a successful model. Yeah. You know, it's, I've, I've been out, out of there for about two, two years now. And, and, but I'm incredibly proud of what we did while I was there and what we were doing together. And then ultimately what the company still means. It's a, it is hard. It's hard to create sort of any kind of brand awareness. Um, you know, today I think it's really difficult, and I think A24 was it was very successful in that, and and I think you know it means something to 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 you know its patrons. What do you, what do you think are the key factors that make you a successful executive in this industry? You know, you've been doing it now for quite a while. What are those? Um, I hopefully listening is a big one. You know, trying to stay attuned both to market trends to you know, your, your colleagues and, and being a, a good critical listener is always something that I try to value. Um, trying to stay inquisitive, you know, not, not, not getting comfortable and, and really trying to push outside of comfort zones. You know, I think when I've defaulted to like, oh, 
I think I can sell this. I don't really want, you know, like that kind of area is when I've gotten into trouble, but really kind of pushing and, and striving for, you know, uh, something that's just beyond maybe where I'm absolutely comfortable has always been where some of my greater successes have come from. Um, you know, I think teamwork, and, and you really see it now, it, it, you know, as we all kind of figure out what this virtual office that we're all working in in the Zoom, but just being a good collaborator, being transparent. I think one of the things that we really tried to eradicate in, in starting A24 was just that competitive politicking that is so present mm. in the in this industry in particular. And it's like the, the, the group success is your success, and we'll reward you with that you know, creatively and financially, what have you, but just, you know, keep moving it forward. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, continue to try to, 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 to push. How much, how often do you use gut in making green light decisions <laughs> moving forward on the project? Yeah, I mean, it's hard because, yes, a lot. You know, you can look to a historical precedent in the film business and there's models for everything, but some of the biggest, success stories are always the one that come out of left field and it's just like is the market ready for this and things are cyclical and you can kind of look at historical trends and you're really just kind of looking at downside scenario because you know if anybody would have predicted what you know todd phillips did with the hangover like yeah. no right and he bet on himself and won in a huge way and had a huge you know, financial participation in that movie because the studio you know, it was like, all right, we believe in you, but we don't necessarily believe in this or these people. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, you kind of keep, you know, you got to go with the gut sometimes because the numbers will never line up. Right. Mm -hmm. As you look over the next three to five years, what, tell the audience what, what you think some of the key trends will be in the movie industry. I know we talked about the move away from maybe traditional theaters, but what are some other trends that we'll see? Yeah. I mean, I, listen, I, I hope, yeah, I, I hope theater business stays vibrant. You know, I think it is, you know, a, a community, you know, aspect. And I think it's a great thing. I think as you look at some of the movies, you know, those romantic comedies, which have fallen out of favor, just because, you know, as the studios look at it, can I put $250 million in a Marvel movie or should I make, you know, four, you know, mid-budget movies and what's the rate of return on those? And it's just financially modeling it, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't necessarily mean that those movies don't have an audience anymore, but it's like, you know, do I get the babysitter and go out and do all the costs that are associated with going to the movies? Well, I think what you've seen is Netflix prioritizes those movies. There is a real vibrant market for them. So I think, you know, some of those mid tier movies, the action comedies, the, you know, the romantic comedies, things like that will kind of flow back into, into, you know, the streaming world. You know, I think things like horror, which again is a really communal thing, are what I hear is anecdotally doesn't play as well in the streamer market. You know, that, you know, really jump scares and being, you know, in that theater is a really important, yeah. you know, component of yeah. that theatrical experience. And so, you know, we'll, we'll kind of see. But I think some of those sectors that, you know, like romantic comedies again and, and action comedies will kind of come back and you'll see them, you know, programmed again comedy itself has been hard theatrically like what's working you know we had a, a real run for a long time and obviously Judd Apatow and McKay and Will Ferrell and sort of you know that uh, style of comedy and it feels like okay sort of where are we going next mm -hmm. um, and obviously Judd has a big movie coming out in a couple of weeks um, um, but and we're still working at a high level but sort of like what's that next wave um, and I think we're trying to figure out what exactly that's going to be. Mm -hmm. And, and I know that you guys work, as you mentioned, on, on, uh, often on lower budgets. And do you feel like in today's world, it is possible to make movies that cost far less than others and still break through? Yeah. I mean, it's like anything when you're building, it's all of a sudden you start building a bigger widget and it's just, there's a lot of excess and money doesn't always go to the things that make an impact on screen. It's just, it's, you know, I think it's a factor of any business. But I do think you can return a real high quality product, um, you know, for, for a competitive price. And sometimes, you know, I love the films of John Carpenter, right? And I think, you know, the economy that he brought to his filmmaking made him make certain choices that ultimately drove the creative and made him um, probably work in, and make some really interesting choices, yeah. um, you know, that impacted the film in a positive way. So, you know, I think that 
you know, low budget doesn't necessarily mean cheap. And I think that's sort of what we kind of have to make a, a quality distinction between. Um, but, you know, obviously, as, as we really go into digital, there's a lot of technological advancements that have brought down the cost of filmmaking. Um, and so. And I think the idea, and I know you've done that, did, did this at, uh, a bit at some of the movies you acquired at A24, but in, in finding new talent to it, right? And hoping to find that next star who doesn't yeah. necessarily, you can put in a film and star, have star in a film that isn't going to cost that much. Um, so it allows yeah. it to work, yet you may have found the next major star. I assume that's something. That's exactly. Yeah, there's some movies that you see and you're like, oh, there's something about it. The voice in this is just really, you know, there's something about it that, that, that just resonates with you. The film itself is a little rough and it might not find its thing, but this is somebody we want to be in business with in, in whatever form that is and what they're going to do next. Mm -hmm. And I think you just kind of hopefully find those people and keep, keep working with them um, as, as much as you possibly can. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, you know, the, the traditional Sundance movies are, are finding it hard. You know, because people, you know, they are now like, I think the streamers have evolved and they make more of their own content. Mm -hmm. It's hard for those movies to work theatrically and find a, a their footing. And then in the streaming world, it's hard to kind of cut through. So I think we're seeing things where people need a certain level of spectacle, a certain level of production value mm -hmm. um, to kind of give them scope. I mean, we always talk about, you know, just two people walking and talking. You know, yeah. it's really, really hard outside yeah. of the before sunrise, sunset, all those movies. You know, it's really hard to make those kind of break out right now in the kind of cluttered marketplace. Um, you know, one, one question I've, I've been asking our, our alums uh, during these interviews is uh, career advice. And, you know, it's incredible how many Georgetown students now are, and I'm sure you see it too, because I often call yeah. you to ask you to talk to them, how many are interested yeah. in film? Um, just yeah. said, um, we've now created a, you know, the school has created a film and media, media studies minor. Um, so there's a lot of interest in that program. And um, I know anytime uh, a student who's interested in film can hear from a, an alumnus who's, who's had a, a, a fascinating career in the industry, it's always great to get some advice. So what are some of your kind of key advice pillars that you like to tell yeah. students? Well, I I mean, listen, young it's a, people maybe have already graduated out of breaking in. Yeah, you know, this is a, it's a, it can be a really exciting business. Um, and there's a lot of highs and, and there's a lot of frustrations as, as you would get with any job. I think what's interesting or unique about, you know, the entertainment business and specifically working on the creative side, you know, um, is that it attracts a lot of, a lot of people in the beginning that are like, oh, I love movies. I want to, you know, work in this. And and, you know, there's a lot of work that has to go into making these films. And, you know, they're really hard. And, you know, to get anything up off of the ground, you know, it takes the average gestation of a movie is something like five to seven years. You know, that's a long time to be working on one thing to get made. Yeah. And so, you know, I think, um, you know, you'll see a lot of people flow into the business and flow out of it in that first kind of like one to five years. And so I think, you know, I always say to, you know, Georgetown kids or other interns that have worked for us, it's just like, make sure you don't look past the job that you're hired for. You know, if you're hired to be somebody's assistant, you know, you're an incredibly smart person. You went to an incredible university and you probably, you know, uh, performed at a very high level. And, you know, you're, you're here for a reason, but you're hired to be an assistant. And just don't look past it and make sure you sort of absorb all that you can from whatever that entry level job is. Um, because, you know, you just take in so much through osmosis, you know, whether it's the jargon that you hear, just the financing structures or whatever it is, you know, those assistant positions can be a really great sort of gathering you know, um, tool for, for, for knowledge that you don't even really realize that you're taking in at that right. moment. And so just be open to it. Say yes to almost everything and yeah. just take as much in as you possibly can. And, and the assistants that I've seen kind of like get to that next level um, and get those next jobs are the ones that really anticipate and really sort of, you know, just do the work. We're willing to jump in and do that work because everybody wants to give their notes on a script or cuts of a film or whatever. But, you know, you'll get that great fun stuff if you do the other part of it, which is very simplistic, but yeah. um, you know, shockingly, you know, sort of overlooked. Yeah. What else? Um, that's a big one. You know, obviously, 
phones. It's like this weird thing, you know, it's like I, I had, when I got my first job in the entertainment business, they looked at me and they're like, can you answer a phone? I was like, man, I just graduated from Georgetown. I'd worked at Booz Allen and I was like, yes, of course I can, I can answer a phone. And they're like, well, you've never answered a phone in the entertainment business. <laughs> and it is like this weird thing. Like if you're, you know, most of the people that go on the creative side, either go to work for an agency or a management company or a producer or a studio executive. And the gateway is the phone and it fumbles everybody up. And like one of those things, it's just like, take a breath and you'll be fine. And just master who's calling. Um, one of the great things is like most assistants get to be on their boss's phone. So you get to hear them talking and you just get to participate in a way, right. not vocally, but you just get to like listen in. And I think it's a, it's a really um, unique thing to our business that, that is a, an added benefit. Um, what about someone who's in college now who's just trying to get traction to find a job? What are two or three avenues that you suggest that they look at in trying to gain that? Yeah, job? you know, I, I, I always sort of say, you know, like, what is it that you're excited about? Is it film? Is it TV? Look at who's making those things, you know, both in terms of the production companies, the writers, the studios, you know, what have you, and, and sort of target and then go to their website. Look up the companies. You can just cold call email them. Say, I, you know, I'm looking for a summer internship. Everybody's always looking for interns and people that are motivated and have a connection to what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, and so that is, is is one thing. And then, you know, as I kind of said early on, you know, it, it's hard to graduate and go to work in the entertainment industry because all of your friends are, if they're going to law school or, you know, working in the financial sector or whatever. They're, they're getting their jobs. Working for the government. They're getting, and they're getting their jobs in March of senior year. And they're also Exactly. Saying, you will not have that. Right. You know, like, unless you got hired into the NBC page program or, you know, some of the agencies have very um, structured, you know, in, um, training programs that you can get into. Um, you know, more often than not, you're going to have to move to New York or LA, or if you want to work in production in Georgia or whatever, you know, you, you can, um, you're just going to have to move there and figure it out. And so there's a, a, a kind of a, a jump before you look a little bit. Yeah. And what do you, what are, um, you know, two or three things you look for when you do get approached by a, say a college student does reach out to you. Um, what are the, th and you, are, you do have an opening what are the things that you look for or you ask them to, to, to make that decision to hire them over someone else? That's a really good question. I, you know, some, I, I look at people that ask interesting questions. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a lot of people that come in and they're like, oh, my professor told me I'm the next Martin Scorsese or I'm this or that or the next. And, <laughs> and, and so it's, it's more like, you know, it's like they are, are asking interesting questions about, you know, the company or what we're doing yeah. or, or what have you and not just telling me all of their accomplishments. Right. Um, but really, you know, it's just getting a sense that this person is going to, whether it's Jack's, which is a small team um, that, that where you have to wear many hats. So you have, there's no room for the squeaky wheel. So right. do I think, think this person's going to drop in and be able to drop into this culture, be a seamless participant in this culture and help elevate the culture and, and elevate, great. you know, the whole teamwork. And so that's what I look for more than anything. Because again, you know, it's like if anybody's coming from Georgetown or Columbia or USC or UCLA or NYU or any of these schools or, or Penn State, you know, I don't care. You know, you're all smart kids and, and everybody is very valuable. So it's more like, do they, do I think they'll fit within this? Yeah. And within that, I'm always looking to diversify our, you know, viewpoint. You know, I don't need another person that thinks exactly like me. And so, you know, what, or what my experience has been. And so I think ultimately it's like diversifying, you know, sort of the different viewpoints so yeah. that we can fully reflect, you know, the audience and, and have, you know, varying points of view is always something that we stress. It's interesting. I don't, I don't think uh, students who are, who are interviewing for these jobs, I don't even, I don't think they probably, and I know I didn't really, you don't even really think about fit. You don't think about, Hmm, I wonder if this person I'm, who's interviewing me thinks he'll be good. You just want to, like you said, talk about your resume and show your accomplishments. And, and a lot of people, they don't realize that that is an important piece, but you're talking to a hundred kids who all have great accomplishments and have done interesting yeah. things at that age. What's the fit? What's the diversity piece? Are you going to have an interesting voice to, to lend to the party? And do you have that passion that's breaking through? I, I always talk a lot about that too. You know, that yeah. passion, I think 
when you really see the passion, it breaks through versus others who kind of have the passion. I think that's a good one. I think yeah. that's really important because yeah. you can feel it. You know, there's, there's somebody that, that knows the answers and there's somebody that feels those answers. And, yeah. and you know, there's a big difference. Yeah, that's no, good. Uh, well, John, we're, we're, it looks like we're out of time here. Um, this has been great. Um, again, Thank talking you. to someone in the movie business right now is, is, is really uh, – insightful for our audience and yeah. going through some really interesting times. And so thank you for the time and best of luck. Oh, with all pleasure. Your yeah. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. I'm uh, always good to be a part of the Georgetown family. I'm always happy to talk to everybody, whether it's yeah. GMA or, or at large. So yeah. well, you've um, been a great, you've, you. been, you've been great at that. You put your money where your mouth is and, and students should know that and young alums, that, you know, John has been someone who's been really, uh, really open to speaking. With our, yeah. with our Georgetown Hoyas. So thank you again for that. And um, oh, enjoy, enjoy the rest of the week and stay safe. Right. You okay. too. Thanks Do well, Rich. All right. Bye. Thank you.